Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is a portion of our epistle reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 12, where Paul writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, over the last number of years, there has been a growing phenomenon in our nation that happens pretty much right after Halloween and stretches all the way through the holiday season. And it is called Hallmark Christmas Movies. If you are not familiar with Hallmark Christmas Movies, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But let me tell you about the plot line of every Hallmark Christmas movie. It starts with two individuals, a man and a woman, who have a chance encounter and maybe even have some friction between one another. But you know that in the end, they're going to be a couple. But in the meantime, you have to fill an hour and a half or two hours of movie. And so you set this couple, maybe in a big city, but more often in a picturesque, picture-perfect little town that has its annual Christmas festival with the lighting of the Christmas tree and the, and, and the, the um, gingerbread cookie bake-off and things like that. Um, usually there is either the festival is in danger of being shut down or there is a local business that embodies the heart of that little town and it's in danger of being shut down and foreclosed by big bad businessmen from some big city. In the end, the festival or, or the lodge or the farm is saved. This couple finds themselves in love with each other and, and they're set up for perfectly happily ever after. That is the plot of every Hallmark Christmas movie with some variations. And the fact that I, an adult male, know that I, I've seen way too many of these things, more than I ought to have, but they're kind of engrossing too, I have to admit. It pictures an ideal couple in an ideal place with an ideal life waiting for them. It is Courier and Ives, it is Norman Rockwell, and it ain't real, is it? because we don't live ideal lives. We don't have happily ever afters without any problems in our lives. No, that's not real life. But it's good to have ideals. It's good to have ideals to strive for. That's kind of what Paul is describing in our text today as he talks about how we live as God's people. He begins by telling us who we are. We are God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Just think on that for a moment. You are chosen by God. You are dearly loved by God. This language of being chosen and loved by God brings to mind the practice of adoption. Adoption is one way of describing how we became God's children. Um, up in Indiana, there was a family where the mom had a child from a previous marriage, and then she got remarried, and they had children. And the father chose to adopt the child from the previous marriage. 
And I had the privilege of being in the family courtroom when the adoption was made legal. The joy on that child's face, that child was old enough to understand what was going on, the joy on that child's face to know that now the family's last name was her last name. And the joy in that father's heart to have intentionally chosen and gone through the effort and all that's involved with this process to make that child his own, even though that child had not been born to him. That joy that filled their hearts is the same joy that fills God's heart every time we use that baptismal font. That's the joy that filled God's heart at the font where you were baptized. Because baptism is God choosing you. Saying, you weren't born into my family. No, we were born as the enemies of God. Because, remember those Ten Commandments? Not only do we actively break those commandments, but we're set up to because we've inherited a sinful nature that separated us from God. But God in his mercy and grace says, I want you to be my child. And this is how it happens. When the water is poured upon you and someone says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I am claiming you to be mine. I am placing my family name on you. And now we are the chosen and dearly loved children of God. Well, because we are made part of God's family by His grace, by His choosing, <laughs> We are to live in a certain way. We talked about those Ten Commandments earlier. Those are actions of what you shall or shall not do. Here, Paul doesn't talk about actions as much as he talks about virtues. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. These words that Paul uses are rather abstract. They're not concrete. The commandments are concrete. Don't murder. Don't steal. Honor your father and mother. Go to church. Don't misuse my name. I mean, those are concrete actions. These are more abstract virtues. And when we come across those, maybe it's a good question to ask, what does this look like? What does it look like to, sh to be clothed with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and love? What does that look like? Well, there is no one way that those things look. Because as each one of us is clothed with those virtues, and as we go about our day, we will, we will exhibit those virtues of compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and love and gentleness and patience. We will, we will exhibit those in our own ways as God gives us opportunity, as God has equipped us to do so. Not all of us have the same gifts, Maybe the act of compassion is delivering portals of prayer to cancer patients and their families at MD Anderson. Maybe compassion is talking to your neighbor about problems that they're having and offering to pray for them and even to pray with them. Maybe gentleness is shown in how you care for an aging parent or maybe it's shown as you care for a helpless child. All sorts of opportunities are set before us by God who knows what we are equipped to do. He's the one who has given us our gifts, our temperaments. 
And he asks that as we live our lives, we do so in this way, with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and love, which kind of binds them all together. That's the ideal. That's the goal. How many of us live up to that ideal? How many of us are always clothed with compassion and humility and kindness and patience and gentleness and love? None of us. Strive as we might in the power of God working within us. Strive as we might. Our sinful nature is still there leading us astray, causing us to be unkind, to be proud, to be impatient, to not be compassionate, to not be gentle, and to be unloving. All of those virtues that are the ideal, we, we know how to undercut them. And when we do, we bring hurt into the body of Christ. We bring hurt into our homes, into our workplaces, into our friendships. We are far from ideal. But God doesn't leave us in that predicament. Paul tells us how we resolve that. When the virtues fail, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness is, is the remedy, is the cure for when our virtues fail us. Or more to the point, when we fail to live up to those virtues. Forgiveness is the only solution to that problem of hurt and conflict that we bring into our lives and the lives of others when we fail to live as the virtuous chosen people of God. Forgiveness is the gift that God has given us to restore our relationship to Him. It's also the gift that we are to give to one another to restore broken and fractured relationships. They never apologized. I don't have to forgive them till they apologize, right? They're not sorry for what they did. So I don't have to forgive them, do I? Paul doesn't put that phrase in there, forgive only if they apologize, only if they're sorry. We're called to forgive. Well, I'm going to at least try to get even. No. Doesn't say forgive after getting even. It just says forgive. No time frame, no conditions. Truth be told, just as God forgives us, as soon as we commit a sin, He forgives us because we live in a state of grace toward Him. So as soon as we are wronged by someone, whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they apologize for it or not, our responsibility is to forgive as the Lord forgives us, freely, without condition. It is that sort of forgiveness, which doesn't come easy, by the way, but it's that sort of forgiveness that is the only way to restore broken relationships. Was it easy for God to forgive you? No. It cost him dearly. It cost him the life of his son for God to be able to say, I forgive you all your sins. 
It cost him the life of his son. So forgiveness is not an easy thing to do. It is a sacrifice to make. And yet it is the only way to restore broken relationships. When I conduct wedding services, whatever the text might be, whatever the emphasis on the sermon might be for this couple that's beginning their life together as husband and wife, I always include this part. I always tell them what the three most important words are that they need to keep in their marriage. And I say, they're not the words, I love you, although those are important words. They're the words, I am sorry, followed by, I forgive you. Because despite our best intentions within our homes, within our church, within our workplaces, within our friendships, we are going to either offend or, or, or be offended. And the only way to truly restore those relationships is by applying a generous amount of, I am sorry and I forgive you. Just like we do on Sunday morning, we confess to God our sin. Do you want me to turn around to the congregation and God says, it's no big deal, just forget about it. Or would you rather hear those words by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit those words that we long to hear from God are the words that we need to be saying to one another in times of wrong and hurt so no, we don't live Hallmark Christmas movie lives. We don't live Courier and Ives lives. We don't live Norman Rockwell lives. But that's the ideal. To live as the virtuous chosen people of God. Adopted by his grace into his family. To live as his children and to bring his compassion and love and mercy into this world in which we live. In the assurance that he forgives us for when we fail. And because he has forgiven us, we are now free to forgive one another and to live in the love that binds all of this together in unity. A love that is from God himself through his Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>